pension and success. And we are um, committed to helping students through this quarter and just throughout their time at UCSD. And we know that family members and just everyone that makes up our community is a part of that. Um, and so I have, um, I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maru Figueroa, who will share a little bit about what student retention and success is. So even though you might be familiar with a lot of our units, um, we want you to know kind of like the overall strategy of what that is and that umbrella that falls under. So we thought it would be really important to have this virtual roundtable as a, as a team um, and share a little bit more about who that team is and what we're charged with doing at UCSD. So I will um, hand it over to Dr. Maru Figueroa to share a little bit about student retention and success and why this conversation is so important to us. <laughs> Thank you, Belinda. Uh, my name is Maru Figueroa and I have the pleasure of serving as your Assistant Vice, Ch Vice Chancellor for Student Retention and Success. And I do apologize. Um, as soon as I knew it was my turn, my dog started barking and he's out of control a little bit. So. You know, this is the reality of, of, our, of our time. So I apologize if he keeps barking. I'm trying to like throw him some treats. Um, again, <laughs> uh, student retention and success is, uh, you know, we are focused on providing support to all of our students at UCSD, um, specifically in navigating the university. We have a lot of programs that support the transition from high school, from the community college into UC San Diego. And we are really dedicated into providing opportunities and creating access to the various opportunities that our students have here. So from anywhere from, as I mentioned, transition programs, um, mentoring opportunities with peers and also with faculty, um, uh, fellowships and scholarships, um, in addition to also providing opportunities for research. Um, in addition to that, um, through SRS, we also support very um, specific um, student populations, such as our um, veterans and military connected students, our transfer students, as I shared, our undocumented student services, um, to name a few. And of course, this is um, just a part of, of what we do. But more importantly, we are here to really support and create access to all of these opportunities that um, are available through the university so that, our, so that our students are able to achieve their academic, professional, and personal goals. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to um, engage in, in some conversation around how we can um, navigate some of these difficult conversations, perhaps with our families, and how we can really engage in this upcoming holiday um, in perhaps a little bit of a different way. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maru. Um, and we'll have the presenters introduce themselves just kind of in the interest of time. So we kept it kind of short because we know um, that Zoom is still um, an environment that our bodies and our minds are still getting used to. So we know that we hope that today will be the start of a longer conversation. So parent family programs, CAPS, student health services and care at SARC are critical um, to all of our students in our campus community. So we really wanna thank them again um, for taking the time to be a part of this important conversation um, and to kind of just kick off the um, round table. I want to ask my colleague, Dan, um, from the Office of Parent and, pa Parent and Family Programs um, to share with us kind of in thinking the work that of the work that Parent and Family Programs does with family members of our students and helping them succeed during their time at UCSD. What are some of the strategies or tips you can share with our students and with um, our campus community members who are joining us on the Zoom today and who will engage with this recording at a later time? Um, what are some tips that, you ha that have already been shared with parents and family members as they begin or continue having conversations about boundaries and expectations with the upcoming holiday breaks, specifically in regards to COVID-19? Yeah, thanks again, Belinda, for inviting me to be a part of this roundtable tonight. Uh, as Belinda mentioned, my name is Dan Perez. I am the program coordinator for the Office of Parent and Family Programs. And we, uh, Karina, who's this, uh, Dr. Karina Vio, who's the senior officer, and I really have been working with families, not just in this quarter, but over the summer to kind of really come together as a family unit and make decisions for their student on what environment was going to be best for them to continue their studies or start their studies here at UC San Diego in this fall quarter. 
Um, and so what we've got is about maybe a three pronged approach to having conversations with your family members regarding um, not just the holiday breaks, but for Thanksgiving, but also for winter break and the break between the fall and winter quarters. So the first step we have is kind of reflecting on where uh, you have been for the past two months and, and primarily that UC San Diego bubble. Uh, the job that UC San Diego has done to try and keep students safe, uh, what that means, so the limited social interactions, uh, the testing, the symptom screening, how that plays into your routine as a student and the life you've been living the past two months and how that may change when you go home. Uh, so the first step that we kind of have is reflecting on where you've been, what you've been comfortable with. Um, and that leads into discussing with your family what you're comfortable with. Uh, that goes beyond the use of masks. It goes on to social distancing. It goes on to the amount of people or family members at an individual gathering, how to keep that safe, what you're comfortable with. It can be kind of a uh, shell shock to being very strict in self-isolation or social distancing or social isolation for some students. And then going back to uh, a full household with siblings, uh, family members, aunts, uncles uh, around the holidays. So discussing with your family members what you're comfortable with um, around the holidays and when you'll be home um, and away from campus and away from what you've been experiencing for the past two months during the pandemic. Uh, and then we also have, you know, we also recommend considering, you know, how going home um, or remaining on campus impacts the rest of your quarter. Uh, there's good news, there's lots of options, and you can actually head over to the COVID-19 FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions page um, that HGH has put together at this link listed in the slide. Uh, and they go over the, the um, different options that students have depending on how they may be traveling um, for these upcoming holidays and breaks. And what that means if they plan to return to campus, when they plan to return, um, or if they're planning on staying home for the rest of the fall quarter. Uh, and I will say, if you do plan on going home and you do plan on staying for the rest of the quarter, it's having um, conversations with your family about considering what you may need to ensure that you can be a successful student for the rest of the quarter if you'll be studying and working from home. I mean, COVID or no COVID for, for me, my first year after uh, moving away to college, I think it took two weeks for my sister to take over my closet. So space does change among family members when, you know, uh, you go away to college or you're um, away for an extended period of time. And so it's about negotiating that you may have the space you need when you're coming back, especially this may be a, a more prolonged time than it has been before. If you're not a first year and this is your second or third year um, and you're used to only being home for maybe a week or two. And now it's going to be an extended break uh, from campus because of the current um, pandemic. Uh, talk about what this means for not just space to work and study, but uh, what it means for balancing your family responsibilities. Uh, for extended periods of time, if you're going to be home, there may be chances that your family may ask you to contribute to the household or help with family members or siblings. Um, so discuss and consider what that may impact on your role as a student when you're taking um, distance learning classes and what you may need. Um, so you can come to a, an agreement on the schedule. Uh, we had a session earlier in the quarter that spoke to families who had their students studying at home and how they can work together to come and create a schedule and a shared understanding of what the students needed so that they could be successful while doing distance learning. And so if you are going home for the first time this quarter and going to be remaining there for the rest of the break, this may be an opportunity to have that conversation that you haven't had to have yet um, that some students have already had with their families. Uh, and lastly, something that we may not think about, but uh, the access to technology and internet. Uh, we have some families who the limited bandwidth that's available in their area at their home is very limited. So they have to take turns for their students because they've got multiple students uh, taking distance learning classes. So coming up with a schedule of when you can be on the internet and when your sibling can be on the internet, or if your parents are also working from home or other family members working from home, that also impacts bandwidth. Um, and access to technology too, you know, it depends on how many computers or devices are in the house um, that you may have your own when you're away and on campus, but going home, you may have to share. Um, that plays a role in your decision. And so it's about coming together with your family and discussing all of the needs that you may have, depending on what choices you make and the options presented to you by the university. Uh, overall, our perspective as an office when we have been communicating with families is to let them know that the university 
and our office is abiding by the county guidelines. And that's how we're trying to ensure that we communicate to families that the options we're providing for them are in, in accordance with the, the county and the state. But really, you know, we follow families' conversations on Facebook. We get inquiries to our office through email, um, on the phone. And they're really not concerned about their students coming home or not. What they're really concerned about is their student safety. Um, and that's always been the, the family's priority uh, during this pandemic. And, you know, just when there wasn't a pandemic to worry about, families are always concerned about their student safety. And so these are where, you know, the conversation should rely. This is what it should be uh, focused on is how can you remain not only successful for the rest of the quarter, navigate these breaks and traveling, but also stay safe. Um, and we, we assume that families have their, their student safety at heart, but we know that every home is not the same, but these tips and strategies on what to reflect on, what to consider and what to discuss will hopefully uh, lead to some productive conversations. Thank you, Dan. And thank you um, to the Office of Parent and Family Programs for all you do. Um, so we are very lucky as UCSD to be a part of a world renowned institution um, for not just the scholarship, but um, all the health innovation. So we're um, very thankful to have um, our colleague Marisol Torres um, that is going to, to help us kind of decipher all the information. And Marisol, what I want us to kind of consider is there's so much information that is timely um, it can change from hour to hour. Um, it changes from like federal to state, um, to our county, to our campus community bubble, um, like Dan um, mentioned. What are some health recommendations and precautionary measures um, from the student health and well-being cluster that we should take away from our roundtable conversation today in regards to COVID-19 that we should all have at the top of mind as we entered this holiday break? Yes, of course. Thank you for having me here. So yeah, these next few slides that I'll be going over are really looking more specifically, um, you know, COVID specifically information, like Belinda mentioned, really talking about what are some of the guidelines, um, how to kind of keep it all together in one, and then, um, and, and then uh, my colleagues will continue to talk more about how to use that information to have these conversations. So first of all, um, most importantly is to start the conversation early. Ideally, we want to start this conversation weeks in advance, two weeks in advance. Um, obviously, if it hasn't been started yet for this week's travels or this week's holidays, there's still other things that can be done, but maybe thinking also for the future in December when there's more holidays coming up. So part of the reason why we say weeks in advance is because um, especially if we're talking about COVID-19 health and safety specifically. Um, if somebody is visiting somewhere else, really looking at isolating, um, you know, quarantining for two weeks before the travel, whether the person traveling or the person receive, receiving the traveling person. So really um, having that conversation so people can start weeks before. But really just kind of getting into conversation about, yeah. are you um, going to be staying just in your household? And will there be people only within that household? who will be staying there, um, not inviting other households. Are people gonna be isolating ahead of time, testing? Um, are there, it's gonna be travel involved? And then more specifically, the day of these celebratory um, days, what are some guidelines that we can follow? So as Dan already kind of mentioned a little bit, and also Dan, I was that sister who took that closet and took that room. <laughs> Um, in my household, so I know that happens. Um, but if, you, if you're living on campus, obviously our recommendation is the safest as far as COVID-19, um, and for some students, safety for other reasons too, might be to just stay on campus. Um, if a person does choose to go home or choose to go visit and travel somewhere else, um, considering just staying there till the end of winter quarter, and just because it's already a little risky um, as far as COVID-19 to travel somewhere and now traveling back, you know, makes it a double risk. And then, but if students are coming back, make sure you notify and sequester and all of this information. Um, if you do live on campus is found in that website and feel free to, if you do need to notify and sequester to contact the correct folks um, in your housing. If traveling, just keep in mind that any form of travel increases risk, whether it's driving, whether it's 
getting on a plane, some might be riskier than other, but there's always some type of risk. So if a person chooses to travel for the holiday breaks, um, just keep in mind that that's not risk-free. And as I mentioned before, trying to isolate two weeks before. So staying, staying um, at home, whatever that home might be, trying not to be out in public, making sure you're wearing masks, doing all of these things if possible. Um, again, for the person traveling and the person's receiving this traveling person, which I know in some households that might not be possible. Um, so just keeping that in mind that when these things aren't possible, it just increases the risk a little bit more. And then monitor symptoms and get tested before traveling. Um, so if making sure, especially if you're living on campus, um, you're getting tested regularly, but if you're not also just go to find some free testing. And then um, remember that even if a person gets a negative test, it does not guarantee freedom from infection. So it doesn't mean that a person doesn't have it. It just means perhaps they haven't tested positive yet. Um, and from the time they tested till the time they get to where they want to get, there could have already have been um, you know, an infection been passed. So don't assume that that's 100% accurate and that, that everybody is in the clear, but it's still a good strategy to do just in case someone does come out positive, then we know for sure, hey, you know, we need to take steps for that. And then of course, traveling during or during travel, just follow safety, safety measures. So wearing your mask, hand sanitizing, washing your hands, keeping a distance, um, all those things. And now for the actual celebration. So if there's a celebration happening and sometimes that might be an actual holiday or sometimes families wanna celebrate that a person's back home. Um, so whatever that might be, some of the things to consider obviously is that um, the smaller the better and preferably if it's just within that household. So if someone is traveling and going home or going somewhere else, um, they're now technically another household, right? So now that we're talking about two households. So adding more folks to it can be um, even more riskier. As far as guidelines, so we're talking about California, um, gatherings that include more than three households are technically prohibited in California. So um, really trying to keep that in mind when thinking about celebrations. And then shorter, so keeping them shorter, an hour or two is the recommendation we hear often, state, federal, um, really looking at just having these celebrations be much shorter. And then also safer. So same kind of guidelines we've been hearing over and over again, um, wearing masks, staying six feet apart, perhaps having a celebration outside, washing your hands. So just remembering smaller, shorter and safer um, is always best when actually doing a celebration. And then just some general kind of information about local and state guidelines to kind of try to put any um, clarification as I know things change oftentimes daily, um, but just keeping in mind that California specifically has a limited stay at home order, which some people are kind of calling that the curfew, but um, it's similar to the stay at home order that was issued earlier in the year, March or April, but um, this one is just at a specific time, right? So from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, not being outside, not um, doing anything that isn't essential. And then California travel restrictions. So California and some other states, so always check also if traveling out of state, but specifically for California, if people travel outside of California, when they come back to California, they have to quarantine or self-isolate for two weeks. So keeping that in mind as um, you're thinking about what it will look like coming back um, to California. And then we talked about the California requirements of private gatherings being three households or less. And then always um, wherever, if a person is traveling somewhere else, maybe it's a different city, um, maybe it's a different state, uh, making sure to check local and state guidelines. And you could always do that by visiting the health department for the specific area or state or county websites to see if they have any additional guidelines. But these are, um, these are the guidelines for California. And then again, just um, additional resources to return to learn, which you'll see on every slide here. And um, also looking at sandiegocounty.gov, if you're looking at more specific guidelines for San Diego, the California Department of Health. So that's the one that we can find information about California guidelines. And then CDC, where you can find information about national federal guidelines.
Thank you, Marisol. Thank you to you and everyone at the Student Health and Wellness Cluster um, that continue to just go above and beyond in helping us learn and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Um, so next up, um, Dr. Juarez, you and the team at um, Counseling and Psychological Services um, help us even before COVID um, to overcome challenges. What are some um, tips and advice and information you could share with us on um, some of the new challenges we're facing with COVID-19 and um, establishing boundaries and expectations? Yes. As we know, these are really difficult times in the sense that uh, we are creatures that live through habit and we have our rituals, our ceremonies. And uh, since Halloween and now this month of November with Thanksgiving and December with so many holidays, uh, uh, then it becomes a major decision making. What should I do? Uh, should I stay where I am? Should I go to my family? Uh, what is that I want to invest myself and my time based on what I need and what I think would be important to do? So next slide, please. So it's going to be very important that we reflect and assess where am I in all of this? Sometimes our brain needs to be in denial of everything that's going on around us. And our brain is going to filter information. And with that, denial is very convenient in the sense also that we are going to screen the information that we assimilate. And depending on what it is in our senses, that is going to influence what decisions we are making. Some of us will feel shame in the conflict of what we desire to do and what we should be doing. And sometimes some of us will pick safety. And with that, there is always that sense of loyalty and the hope. And we don't want to be with guilt if something wrong were to happen. So when it comes to our emotions, whatever we are, whether we're very clear, whether we're confused, whether we're driven by fear, whether we're driven by love, it doesn't matter. That's what it is for us. And our emotional state or our cognitive state is something that is to be recognized and respected also. Of course, that whatever we do, we will have to let go of something. If we decide to go home, we will need to let go of some of the safety of campus, as we were saying earlier, because we know that being at campus is a very safe place to be. If we decide to stay on campus, then we will have to let go of our longing, our journey, our deep desires to be with our family, just like birds that are uh, uh, migrating and they have that call to fly and move south or move north. These holidays are very compelling and have a call for all of us. Uh, but whatever we do is going to be important that we keep perspective. And uh, as I talk about perspective, if we move to the next slide. It's going to be then important that we become from a place of agency where we as human beings are our agent, where we can reflect, gather information. We don't want misinformation, we want facts. And we are at UC San Diego where science-based facts are very important. And then we have to set our intentions. And of course, that sometimes we hear the saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So our intentions have to really be valid and it's something that we will need to be comfortable with whatever decision we make and the consequences for the future. And then we execute our act. And for that, you know, we will need to be assertive within ourselves as we communicate with ourselves and with others. But in assertion, we know that we have to come from a place of caring and respect. And 
this is a time where we need to really listen to ourselves, but we have to listen to others. And being patient is going to be important. And once we make a decision, being steadfast to what we have decided is going to be very vital. Because after all, you know, we are designing our life. And I always love the saying by Mahatma Gandhi that we want to be the change that we want to see in the world. So that's going to be very vital. And uh, uh, what is it that I want to be and how do I want to live in this world? What do I want to model for others during this holiday season also? Next slide, please. So it's going to be then very, very but basic that uh, whatever happens, we really uh, think of the marshmallow study from Stanford. And in a marshmallow study, uh, it's about delay gratification. And whatever we do, there will be a degree of delay gratification. So if you go home, even if we are in the comfort of our families, that, that delay gratification will be that we want to be breathing without masks, but because we haven't been with our household of loved ones for a while, we might need to be masking ourselves and with distance. And even if I see my grandmother that I haven't seen in a long time, the delay gratification is that I cannot run and hug her and touch her because we have not been in the same space for months. And the delay gratification of the marshmallow study is also the other uh, side that even if I decide to stay at, on campus for Thanksgiving, the good news is that there is another year and we hear the good news about three different vaccines that are going to be available to us, uh, hopefully early next year. And I am counting that the holidays of next year will be in a different space. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Juarez. So Jasmine, um, CARE at SARC has been helping our campus community establish boundaries for a very long time. Can you share with us some strategies that our campus community and everyone can use in establishing boundaries with those closest to us that we love and care about dearly considering our COVID-19 reality? Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Lopez. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Just wanted to do a quick introduction before I jump into this. I'm the intake and program coordinator for CARE at SARC and I'm also a first generation Latina. Uh, I just moved back in with my family after not living with them for I think over seven years. So um, I, I know about having to set these boundaries and having to have these uncomfortable conversations with them because we are not used to living with each other, um, but hopefully, you can use these uh, care approved recommendations like I've been using them to have these conversations with my loved ones. So the first tip that I have for you is know what you wanna communicate. It can be difficult to assert a boundary if you aren't sure what it is. So you really wanna take that time to reflect on your values and how you would want others to act around you. So you can't control another person's behavior or reactions, but you can control what you do and the way that you communicate with others. So a great way to ensure what folks are informed about your boundaries regarding COVID and social distancing is communicating with them directly and respectfully. So when you have these conversations, you want to make sure that you plan ahead and find the right time. You want to pick a time that works for everyone involved, where there are no distractions, time constraints, or other stressors. And you want to ask them, when is the best time to arrange this convenient time to talk? So if you are having this conversation with someone you live with, you want to try to push for an in-person conversation. And if you are having this conversation with someone that you will be staying with over the holidays and to talk over the phone or video call beforehand, you don't want to avoid those text messages or the email just so that you can ensure that folks are really um, paying attention to your tone and your delivery when you're stating your boundaries. Um, you want to be mindful of your tone and watch your language. So using you statements can make people feel like you're attacking them and they might want to become defensive and less receptive to what you're trying to say. So you really want to ensure you're using I statements to center your thoughts and feelings. And you want to ask questions instead of making demands. The demands and orders may make people feel threatened and want to de defend themselves when you're stating your boundaries. So a really good example that we have here is I feel very nervous about the people I love getting sick. So I am choosing to limit my in-person interactions with the family and friends. Even though I want to spend time with you, would you be okay with us spending this holiday apart? 
I want to be able to continue spending time with you in the future rather than taking the risk of getting together at this time. We really like this example because the speaker is using I statements to refer to the decisions that they are making for themselves. Um, when it gets to the point of making a decision that involves both parties, the speaker is really good about asking the question rather than making a statement or an order to the person. And this may make the listener more inclined to agree with them. Uh, next slide. So when having the boundary conversation, we want to make sure we're under, trying to understand the view, their viewpoint and also add to it. So especially if you're having these conversations with parents, you don't want to go in there um, and kind of just order them around because they're your parents or they're maybe your, your older sibling and they're not used to you giving them orders or pushing them around um, to lead to a decision that you want to make. So try to understand their viewpoint and add to it. It's always best if folks feel as though they are on the same side instead of adversaries. So find something you both agree on and add to it. Common ground builds connection, which can foster understanding. And so a great common ground to really meet halfway with the folks you are living with is just really that you care about them. So I love our family too, and I want to get together just as much as you do. And it's because that I care of you that I would like to practice these safety strategies. I don't want anyone I care about getting sick. And this really reassures your loved ones and can be very helpful in getting your point across. In doing this um, and having these conversations, you wanna be aware of your emotions. So you wanna stay aware of how you're feeling. And if anyone is feeling emotionally activated, like activated, it's best to take some time to call down before resuming the conversation. When we do our healthy relationship workshops, we always recommend folks take a 24 hour rule. So if they are upset or if they are angry with the person they're communicating, taking 24 hours to really kind of calm themselves and rethink and see the discussion with a new perspective. While this may not be possible in this like allocated conversation time, you want to plan ahead and maybe let the person know that you need a break. So a great way to do this, whether they're angry or ang you're angry to kind of put a pause in the conversation is simply saying, I feel myself getting upset and I don't think I'm going to be able to share my thoughts with clearly and calmly. This conversation is important to me. Is it okay if I check back with you in 10 minutes? Um, this is a great way to kind of take the stress or take the blame from the person you're having the conversation with, even if they're the ones that are upset and not you. Um, it follows the I statement rule and it also reassures the person you're speaking to that you really do care about this conversation and you really care that they're taking the time to have this conversation with you. And then finally, if you tried all of these tips and it's really not working out for you, it's okay to take the direct approach. When you are taking that direct approach, you wanna make sure you're staying on topic and you're repeating yourself. So if you find yourself or the other person bringing up other complaints not related to your current conversation, which can happen when you're moving back home and you're having maybe fights that are old fights, um, you wanna make sure you're kind of sticking to your point and ignoring those previous arguments. And don't allow folks to guilt you or insist uh, of you adjusting your boundaries. So act as though you are a broken record and keep coming back to stating your need or boundary. This may require a clear and direct approach, which might mean simply stating your strict boundary and not leaving room from arguments. So something can look like, I can see we aren't going to agree on this. I want you to know that if you choose to come over, we will be eating outside and I expect you to wear your mask and stay appropriately distanced. We hope you found these tips helpful and feel empowered to have these conversations. If you'd like to learn more about establishing boundaries or, ser or our services, feel free to follow us on social media. We're at UCSD Care, or you can scan that QR code at the bottom of the slide. And I will also be sharing my uh, email if you'd like to connect that way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And I know I already learned a lot from the link tree just from the QR code itself. So thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Figueroa, our campus community is made up of individuals that come from all different backgrounds and we all bring with us um, the culture that um, our, our families, whether that's blood family or chosen family, um, have created. Um, so what are some cultural considerations that um, we should really uh, take into account in regards to COVID-19? Yes, um, thank you, Belinda. And so I actually, you know, I think a lot of what has already been shared are really important things to keep in mind. Um, I think one thing to be um, aware of um, is that our cultural perspectives really define how we view um, health, how we view illness. And um, these perspectives also really guide, uh, guide us in how we talk about say, for example, um, in this case, exposure and or testing, or we don't talk about it, right? And in some cultures, we, we don't talk about uh, being exposed or going to the doctor and perhaps having to share with others 
um, just because of, you know, whether we're saving phase or these are things that don't come out of, you know, just kind of the, the tight circle of, of the family. Um, and I think the other piece of this is also to keep in mind that, you know, maybe perhaps some of our own family members or community members, right, um, or even within our own household are essential workers. And so um, through their essential employee roles, they are also having to navigate their feelings of obligation and responsibility, not only to the economy of the household, but also to the health. And so these two things are, you know, at odds with each other. And there is, I think, you know, earlier today, one of our speakers shared a little bit about feeling shame. I think it was Dr. Juarez, right? Um, not only in shame of like we wanting to come together, but also perhaps shame or, or feeling um, uh, responsible, right? That I have to go to work and potentially I might have to, you know, I may be the one exposing my family. And so these are things, right, that our, our culture kind of defines for us and how we approach it. And so it's important to kind of, you know, acknowledge that as we engage in these conversations and a lot of the, the, the tips that Jasmine shared with you are critical, right, that we are using, you know, um, I statements um, but for many of us, like, you know, myself as a Latina, we come from a very collective culture, right? And so when I speak with parents, right, making sure that I'm talking about using my I statements, but also in the, col in the context of, of, of we, right? And so some of the examples that you shared earlier is, you know, I don't feel comfortable because I love you, right? I'm doing this because of us, because of our collective family, um, and because of care. And so I think that it's important to recognize um, these, these feelings of, of respect, of obligations, um, and, and responsibility that, um, that we all have, including our families and our parents, as we engage in these conversations and just being aware, right, about um, how we um, engage in conversations about health and illness. Um, so these are just, I think, some things to kind of think it, keep in mind. And I think all of the, the tips that we've talked about so far really kind of help us frame this conversation um, that sometimes can be very difficult with our family. Thank you, Dr. Figueroa. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are at 4.45 on the dot. Um, so we will go ahead and open it up to questions, comments, um, you want to put it in the chat, if you want to unmute yourself, all of those um, are fair game. And again, we also want to acknowledge that this is the beginning of a conversation um, our, as a society, as a country, as a people, we've gone through a lot. Um, COVID-19, um, remote learning, um, a racial reckoning all around the globe, um, a really significant electoral process. So this is just one chunk of so much. And we know that um, our time together is just to, to help you continue critically thinking about establishing those um, in the best interest of keeping you health, healthy and safe and uh, making our whole campus community safer. So are there any questions or anything our presenters want to share that they didn't get a chance to? We'll give it 10 seconds. And again, this recording will be available. Oh, I'm sorry, Rena, did you have something to share? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, practicing being our own uh, agent, uh, that uh, whatever we decide to do, it may all be well, and that we take all the precautions because fortunately we have abundance of information and facts that we can use to keep ourselves safe and our loved ones safe also. So if you have to travel, may you have a fantastic, secure, safe trip and be surrounded with love and come from a place of love. And also remember what Marisol shared about the recommendations about those who choose to leave campus. And for those of you who will be choosing to stay on campus, you have a team of people that really care that will be here, like at Counseling and Psychological Services. We can be reached if you need to talk to somebody and we love to be a support system to each one of you. 
Thank you, Dr. Juarez. And um, Daniel Urena um, uh, shared, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna read it out verbatim. I don't know if anyone agrees, but when having these conversations, it is important to be selfish in the context of keeping yourself safe. Yes, having this conversation is challenging, but one's health is number one priority. And are there any of our panelists that want to kind of chime in on that statement? Sure, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a great sentiment. And I think what I, I shared earlier is especially with family members, we know that they're coming from a place that the student safety is their number one priority, no matter in what context. And so uh, I know as it may be challenging, it may be difficult, it may be intimidating to bring up, but uh, it's important to have the conversation um, and to advocate for your safety and, and your health. And, and you'll be surprised that your family's more than likely going to have those same priorities for your health and safety. And, and really quickly, I'll just also add that I think, um, you know, and, and I'll say this also kind of using on a personal right I statement, I think a lot of us are mourning the loss of perhaps an opportunity that we had right as a celebration that we've had and so I think it's also um, in the context of, of keeping myself safe and my family safe right. Um, thinking about what ways can we engage that are not traditional but still feel connected and, and I think that that re, you know emphasizes the the point of safety but then how can we reimagine this um, in a way that we might still be connected with our family members that doesn't look like it's always looked like right because i think many of us are just kind of feeling that oh sadness of like oh darn i'm not going to have this big dinner with family um but what how can we be creative thank you dr figueroa and i think on that um sentiment it's a great um, time to um, thank you again for joining us. I'll give you some time to download the chat if you're interested, um, or if you um, have been privately messaging any of our presenters, um, we will send again, oh, we will be posting this recording and the accompanying slides on the SRS website, and I will put that website on here. But thank you again to everyone for joining us. Um, and for um, taking the time to engage in this really important and critical conversation. So thank you everyone.